So we'll see there again, there in the opening of the 14th chapter of John's gospel. And Jesus, he tells his disciples there to not let their hearts be troubled. He tells them there, don't let your heart be troubled. Have faith in me, believe in me. Now Jesus, he had to share these words with his disciples. You see, he shared these words after he had in the prior chapter, in the 13th chapter there, after he had identified his betrayer and his betrayer got up and left. He shared these words after he told Peter, again, in the prior chapter there, in the 13th chapter, after he told Peter that he would deny him, that is Christ, he would deny him three times, not one time, not two times, but three times. Even more, when you go back to the 12th chapter, Jesus, he again had told the disciples that he would be lifted up. He had told the disciples that, that his death, that it was looming, that it was coming, that it was approaching. So it would make sense that after the disciples had heard these words from Christ, that they would be troubled in their hearts. How many of us would want to hear our loved ones say to us that they are leaving this place soon? Many of us, we would not want to hear that. If they say that to us, we too would be troubled in our hearts. We would not know what to do. So again, it would make sense that the disciples, that they would have been troubled in their hearts, which again is something that Jesus, he did not want them to do. Jesus, he did not want them to despair. And so again, we'll see there in my key verse where again, Jesus, he told the disciples there to not be troubled in their hearts. He told them not to be afraid. However, we'll see there in my key verse, this time around, Jesus, he gives them a reason there why they ought not be troubled nor be afraid in their hearts. What is the reason that Jesus gives to them there? Jesus, the reason he gives to them there is that he had given to them, not somebody else peace, not a peace that is of the world. Jesus said to them that he gave them his peace. Now, do you understand how valuable Jesus' peace is? Do you understand how valuable, how rich Jesus' peace is? The world, through its riches, I want you to understand today, that it can't give the peace that Jesus gives. It is unable to give peace like Jesus' peace. I hope you heard me. Yes, the riches of the world, they, they can make us happy, can't they? They can make us happy, but as y'all often hear me say, the happiness that, that the world gives, it only can last for a few moments. It's brief. In other words, it is temporary happiness. Sinful man, let's get on us for a moment here. Sinful man is unable to give peace like Jesus' peace. I hope you hear me here today. See, the reason why sinful man can't give peace like Jesus' peace is because sinful man is corrupt in his heart, in his soul. Again, yes, we can make each other happy. I can make you smile. I can make you laugh. But again, like the riches of this world, the, the happiness that I can give to you, it will only last moments. The happiness that you can give to me, it will only last moments before something else comes up and it bothers me. It makes me worry. The happiness that we give is also temporary as well. We can make each other happy for moments, but as I wrote here, at the same time, we can also give each other headaches. Now, the last thing that Jesus desired to do was to leave his disciples alone or to leave them with a headache. And so he again said to them, 
there in the 16th verse. He said to them that he would pray to the Father. He would pray to the Father on their behalf, and the Father would give them another helper, he said there. And he said there, this helper would abide with them, not temporarily. He said that this helper would abide with them forever. Is that what y'all scripture says there? Is that what y'all Bible says there? Okay, let's make sure that we're on the same page here. I don't want nobody watching or listening thinking that I'm making up words here. Now, those of a worldly mindset, Jesus, he said there in the, sixth, in the 17th verse, he said that they can't receive, they can't receive this helper. They can't receive the spirit because Jesus said they don't know him. They don't recognize him. However, he said there again in the 17th verse, the spirit of truth, this helper would dwell with and be with the disciples again forever. Now, when, when Jesus spoke about the role of the helper or the spirit of truth over in the 16th chapter and the 13th chapter of John's gospel, Jesus said that the spirit of truth would testify of Christ. The spirit of truth, Jesus said, would guide his disciples into all truth. Now, this meant that, that Jesus was leaving the 11. He was leaving them with confidence in knowing his truth, the divine truth, knowing his way, that is, the way of God. They would know the spirit of truth. They would know the spirit of error, as we've seen a couple of months ago. In other words, Jesus, he, he gave them, he left with them rest from having a heart of fear. Jesus, he gave them rest from having a heart of anxiety, having a heart of worry, having a heart of doubt. It sounds like to me, maybe you all will agree with me on this. If you agree with me on this, maybe you'll say amen. Jesus, it sounds like to me, he left them with peace of mind. He left them with peace of mind. He left them with a peace of heart. It sounds like to me that Jesus gave them. He left with them peace. Amen. As shown throughout the book of Acts with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit can be received by anybody, not just the eleven. The Holy Spirit can be received by anybody, meaning peace can be received by anybody. Peter, he preached as shown in the second chapter of Acts in the 38th and the 39th verse. Peter he preached that the Lord has said that the Holy Spirit will come upon and will be received by those who repent and those who abide in the will of God. If, if you want to have the peace of Christ, the peace that, that Christ has left, the peace that Christ will give, we have the key to being able to receive it. Again, we must repent and we must abide in the will of God. So to all who are of true faith, I want you to know, I want you to understand today that Jesus, he has left with us the spirit of truth. All of you who are of sincere and true faith today, Jesus, he has left with you. And I'm going to now include myself in that as well. He has left with us peace of mind, peace of heart, and peace of soul. We have peace today thanks to Christ Jesus. Now, knowing that Jesus has given his peace to all of us, that is what he has given us. That is what he has left to the world. It has caused me to consider of late, what are we giving and leaving with others? Have you ever thought about that? What are you giving? What are you leaving with those that you interact with? You see, in my 
two prior sermons here in this series of sermons, we have seen the impact of Daniel's faith, haven't we? We have seen how Daniel's conviction, how it, how it rubbed off on his friends, right? And we saw it last week, how his friends, they, they moved with that same kind of conviction of faith in their hearts. That is what Daniel left with and gave to his friends. And so again, I, I wonder today about us, God's children, we who are of sincere faith, we today who are Christians, I, I wonder about what impact are, are we having on those that are around us? What are we leaving to others? What are we giving to others? What impact are we having on, on our family? What impact are we having on our friends? What impact are we even having on the strangers that are around us? You see, I don't think we fully understand today the impact that we can have on others. I don't believe we fully understand today the impact that we can have on those that are around us on a spiritual level. We, we, we are slow nowadays to give somebody a dollar out of our pocket. Many of us, some of us may be quick to do it, but again, that's something that is material. I wonder today, what impact are we having on people spiritually today? The 27th chapter of Proverbs and the 17th verse tells us uh, the positive impact that we can have on those that are around us. The proverb states that as iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friends. That's a positive impact that we can have on the life of those that are around us. Now, while that positive impact certainly is true. I tell you today that the opposite holds true as well. What is the opposite? Somebody may wonder. Well, I tell you today that if one's soul is foul, if one's soul is bitter, if it is upset, it can have a negative impact on us. If my soul was foul, if it was bitter, if I was upset today, it can rub off on you. That is why I pray before the sermons. So that all of that can wash away from me because I don't want to have a negative impact on you. I want to have a positive impact on you. In other words, I want to lift you up. I don't want to bring you down. See, if one soul is miserable, if one soul is in despair, it can bring the souls of those that are around them. It can bring them down to a dark place as well. And so this is why scripture is filled with encouraging believers to have positive interactions with those that are around us. Scripture desires that we have a positive impact on the souls and the lives of, of those that are around us. Again, the Lord desires for us to uplift those that are around us. For example, over in the 12th chapter of Hebrews in the 14th and the 15th verse, you can write that down so you can read this scripture later. The writer encouraged us as God's children to pursue peace with all people. You see, the writer encouraged that because the writer did not desire for any root of bitterness to spring up in us. Because if a root of bitterness was to spring up in us, it could cause trouble and it could defile many. That is not something that we should desire to do. As a child of God, the goal is simple today for us. It's the same today as it was yesterday. It is a simple goal, simple instructions, as we saw in the Sunday school lesson. Mm -hmm. Our goal is to leave with the others good fruit, mm -hmm. fruit that will uplift them. We are to bear the fruits that are of the spirit, mm -hmm. the fruits that include love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and goodness, for example. 
the fruits that, that include gentleness and then self-control, faithfulness. You see, I say to you today that it's impossible for us to bear such fruit if our spirit is bitter. It is impossible to bear such good fruit from a spirit that is bitter, from a spirit that is sour. Therefore, as Paul said, we ought not judge one another nor put a stumbling block or a cause for falling in the way of one another. Did you hear that word? If you didn't hear it, I'll repeat it for you. See, so over in the 14th chapter of Romans and the 13th verse, Paul said that we as God's children, we ought not be judging one another. How many of us doing that today? Paul said that we ought not be putting a, a stumbling block, a cause for falling in the path of each other. How many of us doing that today? See, to cause another one to stumble and to fall, that doesn't sound like righteousness to me. Does it sound like righteousness to you? Does it sound like, like doing any kind of good to me? Does it sound like doing any kind of good to you? Causing somebody to stumble and to fall down. So why are we doing it today? In the battle of good and evil. We supposed to be on the side of good. We supposed to be God's children, ain't we? We supposed to be Christians today, right? Why are so many Christians calling people to stumble and fall down? Uh-oh. To the Corinthian church, Paul, he called on believers not to give offense in anything so that our ministry may not be blamed. In other words, Paul said we shouldn't be offended. We shouldn't be offending anybody. Why are we doing it today? In the battle of good and evil, we supposed to be on the side of good. We shouldn't be giving offense to anybody. So then I tell you that the goal and the directive for us as God's children, how we should be moving in this world, how we should be moving in the battle of good and evil, it's quite clear and it's quite simple. Go in peace. That is the directive that has been given to us. That's the instructions that has been given to us by the Lord. How should we be moving in this world? We should be moving in peace today. We should be going in peace and we should be going in love. Where is the peace and the love of Christians today? You see, our goal is to leave others with peace, with the peace and the love of Christ, not to leave them with a fruit that is sour and a fruit that is bitter. As we know the manner, the fruit of God, it is sweet to the taste and it is desirable to consume. So why are we trying to push off some sour fruit on people? As David said, we must convince others to taste and see that the Lord is good and that, that his word, that it is sweeter than honey and the honeycomb. I'm not trying to push off no bitter fruit, no sour fruit, no salty fruit on anybody. I want them to see that the Lord is sweet like I know that he is. I want somebody to know that God is good like I know he is good. How God has brought me through my trials and my tribulations. That is what I want them to know. How the Lord was with me after my dad passed away. How he lifted up a household. How we are still standing strong today. Yes, we have our trials and our tribulations. But again, God has seen that we will overcome. That is what I want those around me to know. And I will share that message by again going in peace, not going in bitterness, not going with a soul that is sour. God has not made my soul sour today. God has given life to my soul. Why should I go out any other kind of way? Now, I want us to take a look at some scripture here from the 10th chapter of Matthew's gospel. So if you will, 
Let's turn over to the 10th chapter of Matthew's gospel. And in that verse there, or in that chapter there, we are going to take a look at scripture from the 5th through the 16th verse there. The reason why I'm having you turn there today is because Jesus, he was directing his disciples the first time he sent them out. He was directing them on how they should carry themselves, how they should go out in ministering. We'll see there in that 10th chapter of Matthew's gospel, in the 7th verse, we will first notice there that, that Jesus, he told the 12 what it was that they were supposed to minister, what it was that they were supposed to be, to be sharing there. Jesus, he instructed them to preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Let's be very clear about this here. The primary focus of the 12 was supposed to be the kingdom of heaven, right? Mm -hmm. Not anything else. Their primary focus was the kingdom of heaven. So this was a message since it was about the kingdom of heaven being at hand. This was a message that called on its listeners to repent. Mm -hmm. It's a message that calls on its listeners to prepare themselves because God is on his way. They need to get themselves ready to face him, to stand before the Lord. Guess what? We should be sharing that same message today. This is the message that we should be ministering today. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And it's a powerful message, isn't it? That the kingdom of heaven is at hand, that, that God is coming. That's a very powerful message. It is a message that all people need to hear today, isn't it? Now I want you to notice here the manner of conduct that Jesus instructed the 12 to have in ministering this very important and powerful message there. We see there in the eighth verse that Jesus, he instructed the 12, he instructed them to heal the sick, to cleanse the lepers, to raise the dead and to cast out demons. These are gifts that, that Jesus had given to the 12 there. These are our power and, and authority that, that Jesus had gave to them. But we'll see that with those gifts, with the power and the authority that Jesus had gave to them, Jesus, he said to them there, I hope you see this. He said, freely you have received. Do we see that there? He said, freely you have received. And then he said, freely give. Freely you received. And I repeat, he said, freely give. It does not sound like, and again, maybe, maybe I'm thinking this. Maybe you all will agree with me on this. It doesn't sound like the disciples were supposed to be using those gifts for profit, does it? It does not sound like Jesus had blessed them with these gifts for them to be going out there for some kind of, of gain, does it? It doesn't sound like they were supposed to be going out there doing these things, trying to make a name for themselves, does it? You see, Jesus, he gave them those gifts freely. And again, they were supposed to minister. They were supposed to share their gifts, those gifts. They were supposed to do it freely. Like the disciples, we have received gifts from the Lord, haven't we? Those gifts that we have received from God, we have received them freely, haven't we? Yes. We have received those gifts freely from God because of his grace, that is, his unmerited love towards us, and we have received them through the Holy Spirit, which resides in, in all of us. So therefore... These gifts that we have received from the Lord, when we share our gifts, shouldn't we do so freely? God, he desires for us to share those gifts freely, doesn't he? Whatever we should do, it should all be done in 
not our names, but in his name, right? And, and then on top of that, they, they should be done from a place of sincere love, shouldn't they? All the good that we do, it should be done for the right, the proper reasons to proclaim God's name. And again, it should be done from a, a place of love and not greedy and selfish ambitions. Oh, boy, I don't know if y'all hear me here today. So, so with this in mind, there is a, a certain kind of dignity, a certain kind of honor, a, a certain kind of, of respect that we must have for the gifts that we have been given from the Lord, right? There's a certain kind of dignity, honor, and respect that we must have in then bearing our gifts, bearing the fruits that we bear. There's a certain kind of dignity, honor, and therefore respect that we must have towards those that we are ministering and sharing our gifts to. We must move in the highest kind of dignity. We must move in the highest kind of honor. We must move in the highest kind of respect for ourselves, for the Lord, and for all of those that are around us. Again, I want you to understand today, in the battle of good and evil, you should be moving in a way of dignity, honor, and respect of the highest kind, and you should be doing so from a place of sincere love, not a place of greed, not from a place of seeking power, not from a place of selfish ambition. I hope you all hear me here today. Now, this highest manner of conduct we'll see there as we continue to take a look at the 10th chapter of Matthew's gospel there. It is further instructed by Jesus to the 12 when he spoke to them there about how they were supposed to enter into a town or, or into a city. We'll see there in the 11th verse that Jesus, he said to them that when they were to enter into a town or a city, he instructed them to inquire about who was worthy, who was deserving or who was welcoming. And Jesus said with them, those are who you should stay with. Now, now those instructions there, you know, we don't go around trying to see who is worthy to, to go and stay with today. We don't have to do that. You know, we can make reservations ahead of time. Can't we, we may have some family somewhere. We say, Hey, you know, Hey, I'm coming to town. Hey, can I stay with you? You know, we don't have to go around trying to see who is worthy and, and who is welcoming today. So, so those instructions there, they're kind of obsolete to us, but, but I do want to, to say something about these instructions here today. What I want to point out about the, that particular set of instructions there is that there's an idea here from Christ about not imposing oneself on another, not encroaching on people, not imposing, not forcing yourself onto other. Mm -hmm. Now notice what Jesus said there. Notice that Jesus said that they were to again, enter into a home there in the 12th verse. Jesus said that they were to enter into a home by first greeting those in the household. You know, if I had a pet peeve, it would be this one right here. Greeting those when you enter into a room or a household. I didn't get it when I was little. See, I don't know about y'all. I hope that y'all was raised the same way. But her and my dad, especially my dad, I can still hear his voice today when I enter into the barbershop or, or when I enter into the doctor's office or enter into a room. My dad, when I was little, he would, he would pat us. He would pat me and my brother. Would say something. You say something when you go into a place. You say something when you go into a house. You say something when you go into a room. Don't you be quiet. You say hello. That's how I was raised. You, you, you say hello when you, when you pass by somebody. You know how us brothers do when we walk past somebody, Andrew. We, when we walk past fellow brother, we're going to do them like that. We're going to either do them like that or we're going to nod our head to them. You know, it, it's, it's a sign of, of respect. 
it, it's being polite. It's, it's being courteous. When you simply greet somebody. Nowadays, so, so many of us, we go around, we so stuck in our own ways. We don't look nobody in the eyes when we pass by. We won't greet them. We won't say hello when we enter into a room. We just come in, we frowning, and, and we sit down. I know life is tough. I know life is hard on us. I know we have bills to pay. I know people have, have mistreated us. But, man, at least we can say hello when we go past somebody. Or, or, or when we enter into a, a room, at least we can have enough of respect, again, dignity and honor. At least we can be polite. And again, Jesus, what he said here is be courteous. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Kindness is one of the fruits of the spirit. Mm -hmm. The point of Jesus instructing the 12 here to conduct themselves in this manner it's summed up perfectly there in the 13th verse. Jesus, he instructed the disciples there to let their peace come upon the household that was worthy, the household that was welcoming. Their peace it should wash over that household, all of those who were in, in that house. And this concept is one we learned, I hope, growing up. Grace received should be returned in kind. When you are treated with love, shouldn't you return the love? When someone shows you grace, you should certainly return their grace. This, this just seems like the, the proper thing to do to me. Maybe it doesn't seem that way to, to those that, that aren't me. See, what have they done for us to return their grace, to return their love by mistreating them, by despising them, by, bring, by being angry and upset that somebody has treated us with love? That just doesn't seem right to me. Yeah, we all learned the golden rule growing up. I hope we did. That you treat others the way that you would want to be treated. When we talk about the battle of good and evil, that's the most simple thing to do. Treat others the way that, that you would want to be treated. See, to mistreat those who are kind and those who are nice to you, those who, are, who love you, to mistreat them is the highest form of wickedness. It is a great evil. To, to mistreat those who have loved you. To take advantage of them when they have shown you nothing but grace. That's, that's wicked. That is evil in its most purest form. I can't understand how people can go about being that way today. But so many of us are. Jesus, again, he calls on us to go in grace. Again, he calls on us to go in peace. God, he does not desire for us to go around mistreating people, do he? Now, the problem that many of us we face today is that it often feels more and more that we don't receive grace from those that are around us. We may often feel like we don't receive any love from those that are around us. We live in a society that is quickly becoming more and more mean-spirited. As I have said in recent weeks, there is a vileness in the world today. There is a cruelty that is present in our world today. And some will say, well, it's always been here, Pastor. I tell you, I feel like it's, it's mighty different today than it was when I was growing up. Yeah, it was present, but today is different. Because the vileness and, and the cruelty that is present today is celebrated. People clap at it. People laugh at it today like it's a joke, like, if, like it's a laughing matter. I don't see what is so funny about being cruel and vile to people. I don't see what is so funny about wanting to hold people down. 
I don't see what is the joke about, again, people having to, to go and act a certain way because they fear that they will be harmed or that they will be mistreated. Whatever happened to everybody loving each other? Why can't that be celebrated today? There is this thought that quite a few folks have today to where if someone is mean-spirited towards them, I'm going to be mean-spirited back in return. Oh, y'all, y'all ain't got nothing to say about that. Is this the proper mindset for one of God's ch children? We who are of sincere faith know that such a mindset, we know that that's not proper. Returning hate for hate. We know that that is wrong. Hell, for those that have the burning desire to be mean-spirited today because somebody has been mean towards them, again, I want us to continue to take a look at Jesus' instructions here in the 10th chapter of Matthew's Gospel, where again, there in the 13th verse, Jesus, he told the 12 that if a household wasn't worthy, if they weren't welcoming, Jesus, he told the 12 there that they were to let their peace return to them. He said there again, if that household wasn't worthy, then they were to let their peace return to them. Some of us will look at that, we'll go, see, pastor, it's okay if I'm not peaceful towards those that, that's despising and hating me. So I'll say, see, pastor, Jesus said so. I, I can let my peace, I can let it return back to me. Some of us say, Pastor, why I got to show them peace when they ain't showing me peace? Jesus said, let your peace return back to you. However, again, I, I want you to look at that verse there again. And I want you to consider, I want you to, to think hard about this statement here from Christ. And I want you to think about what it means. Consider this, were the disciples, were they supposed to respond to a household that had rejected them, a household that wasn't welcoming to them? Were they supposed to respond to them with anger and with hate? Would that have been something that Jesus, would, would, would Jesus have done that? You know, when we was little children, we had WWJD, what would Jesus do? It's time for some what would Jesus do moments now today in this world not just for children but with us grown folks in this battle of good and evil yeah were the disciples there were they supposed to respond to a household that had pushed them away by being rude to them is that what jesus said would jesus have responded rudely if if he was pushed away from a household from people we don't even have to ask that question because we see what Jesus did in scripture when he was rejected, when he was pushed away. You see, when Jesus first announced his ministry in his own hometown, guess what his hometown tried to do to him? They got upset with him. They got mad and angry with Jesus and they tried to push him out of town. They had a desire to throw him over a cliff. They had a desire to kill Jesus right then and there when he announced his ministry. Did Jesus, did he push back at them? Did Jesus start brawling them? Did Jesus start fighting them? And scripture says that Jesus, he passed through the midst of their anger. Scripture tells us that he passed through and that he went his way. That is what Jesus did. The disciples, they were supposed, again, the scripture says there, they were supposed to let their peace return to them. In other words, they were supposed to keep their peace. Rather than lashing out and trying to force themselves, impose themselves onto others, they were supposed to have self-control. They were supposed to, in other words, remain peaceful. Keeping their peace, I want you to understand today, 
that was still a manner of actually imparting peace and grace on those that weren't welcoming to them, on those that had rejected them. Again, this is shown to us when Jesus told the disciples there in the 14th verse, when you are rejected, when you are pushed away, Jesus, he told the disciples to shake off the dust from their feet and to go their way. They were supposed to keep their peace, not lash out in anger, in frustration, and be rude. Sadly, such a concept has been lost on, on us today. As many of us, when we are rejected, when many of us are, are pushed away because we have the powerful message of God, we take it personally, don't we? Oh, you ain't going to push me away. You're going to hear this word of God. You're going to hear it today. I'm going to keep on saying it, and I'm going to come back, and I'm going to say it to you again. I'm going to keep on saying it until you believe. That's the mindset that many of us have today. We're going to force it on them. We're going to impose ourselves onto them. What we must remember today is grace for grace. What that means today is that the Lord, he is constantly pouring out his grace, his love onto us. He is constantly blessing us today. And we should move in that love. We have no reason to be so angry and so upset. We have no reason as God's children to be so cruel and, and so vile in this world today. There's enough of that going on today from those who aren't a child of God. So why are we adding to it is what I wanted today. Whether we have been loved or rejected by others, we should never be moved from the grace of God. I hope you hear that today. We should never be moved from the grace that God has shown to us. When he first sent out the 12, Jesus, he understood very well what kind of world he was sending them out into. Jesus, he said to him plainly there in the 16th verse, still there in the 10th chapter, he said, I'm sending you out into the midst of wolves. He knew what it was like to, to be in the midst of wolves because he himself was moving in the midst of wolves. So he knew how they should carry themselves. Mm -hmm. And so he told them there that in the midst of wolves, they were to be wise serpents and harmless as doves. Mm -hmm. When Jesus, when he washed the disciples' feet over in the 13th chapter of John's gospel and the 15th verse, Jesus, he said to them, I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. And these are words that, that penetrate my soul today. It penetrates my heart today. And it forces me to ask and answer the question today. If I am doing my best to follow the example that Christ has set for me, are you doing your best to follow Christ's lead today? So in the battle of good and evil, again, I say to you today, we should be following Christ's lead. And the lead that Christ has set for us is one that is not rude nor vindictive. The lead that Christ has set for us is not one to be walking around with a, a superiority complex. You see, Jesus, he sat with sinners. Jesus, he ate with sinners. He spoke with sinners. He talked sinners. And today he intercedes on the behalf of sinners to justify us sinners. Jesus, he healed all comers, whether they were possessed with many demons or, or whether they were blind, he healed them. Jesus, he even forgave the woman with, with the reputation of having many sins. And when he healed her, he said to her, your faith has saved you. And then he said to her, go in peace. Look at those examples there and consider how you move today in the battle of good and evil. We may not have the power to lay hands on anybody and instantly heal them. However, I do believe that we have the power to be courteous. 
I do believe that we have the power to be polite and kind. I do believe we have the power to love somebody somewhere. I do believe that we have the power to lift someone up. We have that power. On days when they're down, we have that power to make them well. We can do better than what we have done. And that's what I'm calling on today. We must do better than what we have done in this battle of good and evil. We have good fruit to share. And so I call on us today, share that good fruit and do it in a manner of honor, dignity, respect, and love. Go in peace. Amen. 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 Thanks for watching this week's sermon. I hope that you enjoyed this week's message and I hope that you'll share it with someone somewhere. If you haven't done so already, make sure that you like this video, follow the channel as well as hit the alert bell so that you don't miss any notifications, so that you don't miss any of the wonderful videos that we share here on the Newfound Faith YouTube channel.